Lasting change is different than a goal. You don't always get your goals, but you always get your standards. Maybe it'll help you is to think about it this way. I, I try to explain standards to people with a different set of words. Think of it as everybody in life gets their musts. They don't get their shoulds. Right? Think about it. Most people have a list of shoulds, don't they? Don't you have a list of the shoulds, things you should do, you should follow through on? I, I should lose some weight, I should work out more, I should make more calls, I should respond more rapidly to my email, whatever, you know? I should get into the office earlier, I should be you know, more confident. Whatever your should list is, people love to have their should list make, be met, but it's kind of like New Year's resolutions. If it does, it's really exciting, but if it doesn't, which is most of the time, eh, it's a little disappointing, but you kind of know it's not gonna happen. But when you decide something is a must for you, an absolute must, when you cut off any possible, you say, I'm gonna find the way, or I'm gonna make the way. Human beings, when they resolve things, when they make a real resolution inside themselves, which is they raise the standard, they make it a must, they find the way. Now, here's the big biggie. It's how you feel about yourself. That's major. Understanding self-worth is the beginning of progress. How valuable are you? What could you do if you had all the skills? If you took the extra classes and burned the midnight oil, what could you do? What true value could you become? That is one of the better exercises. What could I become in terms of value? What could I really do in the marketplace, in enterprise, family, home, love, experience, marriage, friendship? How valuable could I become? Am I valuable enough to work on what all is still not functioning in my life to full capacity? If I'm operating at 20%, what could I possibly do with the other 80%? And do I have it in knowledge and worth and value and experience? Once you start understanding this part of you, understanding how valuable you are, it is a whole new experience, understanding self-worth. So attitude plays a big, major part in how our life works out. Think about it in your own life. Haven't you had some area of your life where you raise your standard and your life has never been the same? Maybe at one time in your life you smoked cigarettes or you did something and you did it for years and you kept trying to change it, trying to change it and kept telling yourself I should. And then one day something happened. Something just clicked you over. Something took you over that kind of tipping point. And inside yourself you said no more. And it was a very, very different experience, wasn't it? Something inside of you shifted, and what was a should became a must, and you've never gone back. Is there an area like that in your life you can think of? Again, did you ever smoke cigarettes? Did you ever eat a certain way, drink a certain form of alcohol, and then finally say no more, and you just don't go back? And notice this, it doesn't really take any willpower anymore. Because somewhere when we make this click, when we make something a must, we attach ourselves to it. It becomes part of our identity. One thing I've learned in the last, gosh, 33 years of working with people from now over 100 countries, 4 million people, is human beings absolutely follow through on who they believe they are. If you say, said to me, well, I'm really going to work hard to stop smoking, but, you know, I've been a smoker my whole life, and I'm, you know, I am a smoker. I know your days are numbered. You're going to be back smoking cigarettes again because we all act consistent with who we believe we are. I tell people the strongest force in the whole human personality is this need to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. If you define yourself as somebody who is really conservative, you're not going to be crazy and act nuts unless you're really drunk or something and then you can say it's the alcohol when it's really just you finally getting permission to be yourself, the alcohol is your excuse. If you're a really crazy person, you act crazy, outrageous, playful. You don't act conservative because that's not who you are. Very often people say, well, I can't do that. I'm not that kind of person. And I always say to people, really, when did you define yourself? So you and I, if we're going to transfer this to somebody else, frankly, we got to have it too. And think about this. Base of emotional fitness is energy. If you're exhausted, how the hell are you going to have passion in your relationship? I mean, people come home and it's like, even, especially let's say one's kind of excited for whatever reason, kind of frisky or excited to be with that person. Let's say that lucky moment happens. Usually the other one's like, oh, honey, I, I, it's wonderful, but uh, I, I, I'm exhausted. 
I got to eat something. I got this to do tonight. I got to prepare for that. I got to answer my 500 emails. And it just drops to the floor. So here's the scary part. I think most therapists accept this as a standard, like, you know, this phase of the relationship, this excitement, this passion can't last. Because frankly, you're tired. Most of you all day long are dealing with so much of other people's stuff. Dealing with it day after day, there's a stacking for you too. Now, why don't we apply it? We're smart people, we're intelligent people. I'll tell you why. Two reasons. The main reason is that everyone in this room, including myself, we had a horrible experience, and that is we went to a 20th century school. I call it horrible because it conditioned all of us for, to be passive, just like you've been for the first 10, 15 minutes of my talk. You're all in your schoolroom, classroom. I can see you. You're being very nice to me, and I'm very grateful for it. But see, what did a 20th century school prepare you for? It trained you since you were four or five years old to get you ready for a job in the 20th century, which no longer exists. The 20th century job, you were going to be in an industrialized job. So the bell rings at school, and what do you do? You immediately report to your desk, your position that later on you would report to, right? Think you'd be getting a job on a, on a line. And when you get there, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to sit down, shut up, and wait for someone to tell you what to do. Don't speak until they tell you what to do, and then do that. And by the way, do not talk to your neighbor. How many heard this growing up when you were in school all the time? Say, I. Ah. Me too. Now, I was a talker, so I was in trouble. I had a fifth grade teacher, Mr. Giles, that used to drive me crazy because he wanted silence all the time. Every minute he wanted silence. I think he just hated kids, so he was just like really quiet. He used to make me write these 10,000 word essays. Why? I will never talk again in class. I wrote six of these in his class, 10,000 words each. I went to my high school reunion, true story, my 10 year high school reunion, there were several teachers there. There's Mr. Giles. I went up to him, I said, you know, this talking thing worked out pretty good for me. But here's my point though. My point is, we've all been taught to passively take in information, right? So as you're sitting here right now, even if you're having a good time going, well, this is interesting, or this makes sense, or man, he has big teeth, or whatever you're thinking inside your head, you know? If you're sitting here and you're passive, even if you're having a good time, the state of mind you're in gets linked to what you're learning. That's why when I'm working with people, if they're passive, they listen, even if they agree with you. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's really good. They get linked to that state, so later on they feel equally inspired about doing it. Yeah, I should probably do that. Yeah, I should probably do that. So today, if you don't talk to your neighbor, you're out of business. Today, if you wait for someone to tell you what to do, it's over, especially in a relationship. If you're gonna make anything happen today, it has to be completely proactive and different, and yet we're all still hypnotized. So I'm gonna ask you to try something new, and that new thing is this. When we're, act when we're doing this seminar right now, and we take some information in, if you listen to me passively, research shows you'll remember less than 10% of what I said within three months. In fact, some studies is less than 30 days, which basically means you wasted your night, and I did too. If you listen and take a few notes, Research shows even if you're going to read the notes again, it goes up to 40 to 50 percent retention because just the physical act of writing it down drives the groove deeper in your body. If you listen and you take notes and you physically actively use your body, it goes up to 90 to 95 percent. That's like if you yell back the answer, if you engage your nervous system because the groove goes into an active mode, not just a deeper memory. So I'm going to ask you a couple things. One is if I ask you a question, if you would, yell back the answer. That's not so we have a rah-rah session here, because as I told you, I don't believe in positive thinking, but because it'll go deeper and your energy will be higher. How many willing to do this? Say I. I. All those opposed? Motion's carried. <laughs> okay? So we try to give you a, kind of a flavor of things you can do for your body and your energy. How do you relax it? That's what we're doing, Master Co. Kind of calm the mind. How do we cleanse it? How do we tap into our emotion or capacity to be all that we can be? So last thing I want to do before we go for our final, this is it on the challenge finally, is there, you know, I've been doing Q&A with the Zoom room where I can see them and interact, but we haven't really done that with the main group. So some of you have a lot of similar questions. So my team just grabbed, I don't know, four or five questions from people that we can't see on Facebook or YouTube. And let me do my best to answer some of those. Again, we try to pick themes, like a lot of you are dealing with marriage issues or you're dealing with uh, weight loss or you're dealing with whatever and hopefully when I'm giving answers to these individuals can give you if you have issues in that area some insight as well the guys there every day the guys pushing and shoving because the truth is no matter how good your ideas are how good your art is or how good your skill set is and then you start to engage parts of your mind that you never engaged before when you're in suffer mode and you say I'm not going to quit and then once you do this over and over and over again, it becomes like breathing. 
I don't want to live this lifestyle, but to get to the other side of this, I have to. King year for as long as it fucking takes for you to get where you're going, you should be consumed with that path. You have to dedicate every breath, every ounce of energy, and every thought and effort that you possibly have in your heart. That's why you point the finger. You ain't ready for the pain. You grow. You got ideas. You got talent. You got gifts. Stop shrinking down. Stop minimizing yourself. Take the risk on you. Take the risk on you. You owe you. We gon' get hurt. We gon' cry. We all go through it. You think you the only one? You think you special? Some of you though, you let your pain pump you. You let your pain make you quit. I'm telling you, do me a favor. Just don't let it break you. If you get past it on the other side of it, it's going to be phenomenal. I don't want to go through this process, but nevertheless,